Yeah, yeah, pretty unbalanced. So, I mean, I was probably sleeping four to five hours a night, every night. That was like my typical, which is less than I would have liked to sleep. Um, I, the current evidence, if you want to go purely scientific, would suggest that if you spend on average more than seven uh, and a quarter hours in bed per night, you're, you're increased risk for morbidity and mortality. It goes up. Just because, but if you think about very sick people, they spend a lot of time in bed. It's an association, right? So yeah. it's not the, the fact that you stay in <laughs> Yeah, you oh, eight hours is increasing you, your risk. Right. You, you snooze yeah. your alarm a couple times longer, then you're going to die sooner because of it. It's just usually that that's reflective but, of other things going on. But you probably are. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but then if you sleep less than that, that's probably not ideal either. Um, yeah, as far as what I did, again, it's just underslept and... What are you gonna do? Not train. Yeah. So it's, that was the thing. I, <laughs> well, it's just one of those things, though. It, it's like you know, if you have too many things on your plate, you're gonna sleep less. That's the first thing to go. And uh, trying to trying to make progress with uh, suboptimal sleep is tough. Can be done. And I don't think that you can juice another pathway for recovery to make up for that. So eating more while you're underslept is not gonna work. All right, uh, you know, training less is probably not going to work. <laughs> right, uh, it's just you're going to be tired and irritable. That's probably the more likely thing. Yeah, and people talk about striving for like balance in all aspects of your life all the time, and that's just generally unrealistic if you're trying to accomplish stuff. So, you know, the idea is that this is a temporary phase in our lives, and you know, it has indeed gotten better. So. For four weeks, I trained three times a week. But otherwise, I was training four times a week while I was in residency. Yeah. Medical school was like. Medical free school is pretty easy. Like three and a half hours sessions. Train through. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. But we had. Di it's funny because we have like diametrically opposed different approaches in medical school. Because I never went to class, ever. Less than a handful of actual classes that I attended during my medical education. I just studied on my own, whereas also went to class, but then had more free time outside. But I get my, I'm, I'm biased, because I, like, I study from, you know, the beach, or a foreign country, <laughs> for instance. So I think that, the first thing I'll state, everybody wants older folks to live longer, more productive, healthier, and higher quality of life, life than they are right now. And we all agree, strength training is an excellent, uh, should be a huge part of that. So we all agree on that. We just fundamentally disagree on the programming for those folks. And, and I would even say incorporated that that even trickles back to the novice stage. Because what you will see is that two days a week is the recommendation or is a stock recommendation or two days a week with one set of five, one set of three or something like that. And then that is never titrated up volume wise. The preference is to just add weight, which we do not disagree with initially, but at some point that stops working. And how do you know it stops working? Because they can't do it. At which point they have said, no longer will intensity alone drive my adaptation. I need more training stress. And since intensity was just shown to not work, it has to be volume. So at that point, we would add volume to the situation. And it makes sense to us that as you continue that like progress out, once two days a week with three sets of five stops working, you have to add a third day because that increases training volume. And then once that stops working, which would be the stock starting strength novice linear progression, you're going to need even more volume to which people throw their hands up and say, this cannot be. It's completely wrong. You don't know because you're not old. And to which our reply is, okay, but we do train old people. And the scientific literature does look at this and it's overwhelmingly clear. I don't know how you can get to a different endpoint than we're at, unless you do what we're suggesting you do incorrectly, mm -hmm. 
which is the five sets of five at 85%, which we would never have anybody do. It would be five sets of five at 70%. Or if we thought that that initial stimulus was too much, it might be five by five at 65%, because we want that extra volume. We think there is utility in that volume from not only a getting stronger standpoint, but also a let's control your blood pressure, let's control your blood sugar, let's control these other cardiometabolic either risk factors or actual diseases with that extra volume. That's where I think most of the, <clears throat> the reluctance and the hesitancy comes from is that when you have a brand new novice who's gone through the progression and they get towards the end, right? And every rep's a grind and they pride themselves on being able to go in the next session, add five pounds or two and a half pounds or whatever and grind out the next three sets of five PR, which is awesome, they're getting it done, right? But that's all they've ever experienced, right? So they have come to associate the only metric of progress is more weight to the bar that day. Getting my next PR as soon as humanly possible and anything else is wasting time, yep. right? Whereas all of these people that I've taken and subsequently trained into their intermediate phase and I've, and I've transitioned them to the point where we're accumulating much greater training stress, training volumes at these lower intensities, their initial reaction is, am I getting anything out of this, right? Because it's 70%, that's not heavy. It's not grinding. How can that be useful, right? But then when I'm able to get them to accumulate instead of doing, you know, just a couple sets over the course of the week, they're doing 15 sets over the course of a week or more or something like that, then they start to realize it, especially when their performance starts moving again and they feel less beat up because they're not grinding everything all the time feel less tired and achy compared, they're not dreading every training session anymore because the volume is high, but the intensity is managed appropriately, right? So that's what I think it is. It's just an underappreciation for the value, the potential utility for that 65 to 75% range, say. I think everybody agrees that, hey, 75 to, in the, to, to 80 or so, low 80s can have, is, is super useful for strength. The yeah. research literature would, would agree with that in terms of when I said that strength performance, you need exposure to heavy weights. So yeah, you need to be getting into that 80, 90, 100% range occasionally, semi-regularly to be able to express that strength. Uh, but where the most of your training volume should come from, I think it's underappreciated where the lower limit of that range is, if that makes sense, right? So I mean, I do a lot of, you know, I, I accumulate tons of volume in that 65 to 75% range and It's one of the things you were just talking about with yeah. people who do well on intensity versus, you know, so, so, so I think I've adjusted lots of programs based on what I perceive in terms of the personality and the training approach of the lifter. It's not something that, so I don't do, I mean, I don't think we have enough data. He's doing this as an interesting kind of experimental deal where he does this uh, kind of pre-screening validated questionnaire and then uses that to guide some decisions. Usually I start people out as if they're just, you know, anybody else because I don't know anything about them and then I tweak things from there. So if I have somebody, for example, who's just like loves just getting after it every time, gets super hyped and grinds every single weight, then yeah, I'm gonna adjust my programming based on that because it's like I have to pull the reins back on you, right? <clears throat> Versus the other, the other way around or somebody who gets super bored and they're just like, you know, just getting carried away and wanting to do tons of other stuff, I might have to take a different approach in terms of what exercises I might choose for them while maintaining the amount of stress and fatigue and everything that I'm looking for. So. Yeah, you have to, I mean, stuff needs to be tweaked, again, post-novice, right? So I, this segment is probably gonna get taken out of context at some point. Say so you're suggesting that novices need to be doing eight sets of five of, you know, tempo pin squats or something. It's like, no, we're on the same page, but intermediate land is where everybody agrees that other variables come into play and, and, and you have the option to manipulate lots of them. Um, whether it's volume and intensity frequency based on the person uh, or also exercise selection is, is another perfectly valid variable to manipulate at that point. And so a lot of those ones start to get manipulated based on a number of things, one of which just is based on my observation of a lifter and how they're doing uh, and how they approach their training. And if, if they're doing something I don't want them to do, then I try to make it impossible for them to do that thing. You know what I mean? If someone overshoots all the time. I'm not going to program you if I'm using for a particular person, if they work well with you know, an RPE style program, I'm not going to give you any nines because you're going to turn those into 11s. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's better if it's so, 11. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just so, examples, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
I don't think I have anything to add to that. I think it's interesting what Tushar is doing, though, the Big mm -hmm. Five stuff. Mm -hmm. Certainly sparked some of my own curiosities about that. Mm -hmm. So I see no issue with running the bridge back to back, particularly if you had robust results the first time. If you have robust results the first time, my expectation is that the second time you run it through would be less, and then potentially a third time through would be even less, if any at all. Uh, effectively, because you're exposing yourself to the same stimulus, right. and it's not changing um, from a volume perspective, overall fatigue, fatigue perspective. So I would expect that at some point you will need more stress, likely in the way of more volume, uh, a potentially different exercise variations that are more uh, applicable to you as the, tra as the trainee. Uh, in any event, so I would see no problem running it second time through. That's thing one. Thing two, uh, I would like to preserve as many pure rest days as possible. Uh, most of this data comes from endurance training where they do the same amount of volume over the course of the week, but some people do double days and have actually pure off days, whereas the other group trained seven days a week. And at the end of the study, they tested a 5K and those who had the off days actually performed better, even though the actual workload of prescription was the same. S suggesting that they can dissipate fatigue on actual off days a little bit better, or the alternative hypothesis is that training under fatigued state when they were doing the double days actually increased their fitness better than training day after day after day. That being said, if your schedule is compromising your ability to complete all of this training, then I would just spread it out throughout the week. My personal experience with training every single day is estando bueno. Uh, and honestly, it was the same workload as training four days a week, but it just didn't work well for me to, split, to spread that out over seven days, uh, even though I was doing the same exercise, the same volume, I would otherwise be compressing to four days. So if you notice, the third exercise of the day on the bridge in particular, your performance is not good, like if you were doing that exercise fresh. It's very, very depressed, but that is almost by design in that you're seeing it in a fatigued state. So you're, you're getting that exposure to the exercise under fatigued state. So the weight is lower, right? You're not able to express max amount of force, this, that, and the other, but ultimately the stress then is appropriate versus if you saw it the next day when you had a little bit of time to dissipate some of that fatigue, central governor model is not necessarily tamping down your ability to produce force as much, and then you do it with the heavier weight. And then that bleeds over into the next session so I would prefer to keep as many full days off, rest days, as possible in that situation. And then once it stops working, then you have the option to move on to more advanced programming Correct. that then has you training four days a week. Correct. Correct. Which is fine. Which is ultimately, if you think about the natural progression of a trainee, they'll start off, we'll say, two or three days a week at X amount of volume, right? And at some point, when you have to increase the stress, the volume has gone up enough where they can no longer acquire that stress within three discrete training days. So now it may be four days. And then it may be five days, six days. Ma Max Ada said when he squatted, his max front squat, he had front squatted over 30 times that week. <laughs> yeah, well, so when you see people who are yeah. squatting double days, effectively what they've to told you, if, if they've done this intelligently, right, and been training for a long period of time, is that they have squatted so much they are no longer sensitive to squatting, you know, once per day, three, three times per week, you know, four times per week. And now that they have to do multiple sessions, the only way that works with their life is to do multiple times per day. Yeah. Overall, the idea is to generate fatigue, and that's the only way they can do it. Yeah. Yes. And yes. Uh, so the cardiovascular associations with diagnosed celiac uh, are pretty well described, and it's not obviously just to due to the decrease in whole grain intake, but there are other factors the nature of the disease itself um, <clears throat> and associated uh, effects on other tissues in the body, including like formed blood elements, for instance. Um, uh, I mean, every single organ system can be affected by celiac if it goes untreated or undertreated for a long enough period of time. But that the association between increased risk of cardiovascular disease and celiac is pretty well established. As far as what I would do about it as a clinician, I would make sure that my person who was diagnosed with celiac has an accurate test and that the grade of the celiac that they have is not like a grade one, where that person actually would be still eating some grains. You know, if it's like, you know, it's very severe, then no, you know, but that person's also likely being treated with medication for their celiac as well, versus just a gluten-free diet. 
right? So I just, I guess I would do my due diligence. Also, it's interesting that I know actually one patient that I have uh, right now was previously diagnosed celiac by a tissue biopsy and then had a subsequent one done uh, about 10 years later and is no longer uh, celiac, even after they had been eating bread for 60 days. Yeah, it's interesting. So what I'm saying, I'm not saying that that's the normal experience, but I would make sure there's an accurate diagnosis first and second, any other additional risk factors for cardiovascular disease, I would make sure are well controlled. <laughs> From a training perspective, if you have untreated celiac and you're not absorbing nutrients, that's a bad problem. But other than that, no. Does that make sense? Yeah. I... Yeah, so basically untreated celiac's badness, <laughs> right? Improperly diagnosed celiac, badness. Right. But if it's properly diagnosed and it's properly, properly being managed, then I probably wouldn't do anything different, you know? <laughs> Than a, than a other uh, any, somebody without celiac, for instance. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Anything, Doctor Baraki? Nothing to add. You concur? I concur. <laughs> All right. So, band band twists. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but you don't have to use that at all. So, a few things would be to really try to accurately assess what their anxieties and their fears and their concerns are. What are they afraid is going to happen? Right. Number two, you train a lot of these people already. You have a vast library of experience with them. And I uh, think it would be valuable for them to see what you're doing with some of these other people, potentially. Uh, but the other thing, the final thing, and this is the same approach that we take in a lot of rehab contexts, is something called graded exposure. So you don't, you know, you know, one of their fears might be, say, they're probably picturing what they're seeing in the gym happening already, somebody squatting 315, and expecting you to walk in with them on the first day, put 315 on the bar, and load it on their back, right? Wait, is that? <laughs> it's not how you train these people. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to that address that fear right away, that you're going to start with a training bar, empty bar, body weight box squat, or if they can't squat, on a leg press, right? So that fear is out of the way, and they're still not wanting to squat, for example, right? I mean, at pretty, I've never encountered somebody who's afraid to get up and out of a chair, right? That's effectively a squat right, to a box. That's some place you can start. You get a training bar. So that's the graded exposure. If you need to start them on a leg press or some sort of a machine like that, then you choose the machines that are going to get you the biggest bang for your buck. The one that I would choose would be something like a leg press. Something mimicking the main movement. Say, right, say it's a leg press. Say it's like a whatever, hammer strength press kind of a thing or something like that until you can get them desensitized from the fear perspective, right, to the point where they're willing to handle a training bar or something like that. Does that make sense? But the biggest thing within all these contexts is talking to the person, figuring out what they're afraid of, right? This is both right, healthy people who are trying to get in under the bar and also people who have these pain issues. Assess their fears, anxieties, address them, and then graded exposure. Yeah. Titrated up. Titrated up. Titrated. The RP for him stands for rate of perceived eye <laughs> distortion. Rate of eyeball exertion. Yeah, exactly. So my question would be, do you think it's a good tool to use for lifters? No. Or to indicate? No. We don't. Oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, don't like lump me in your... your for somebody who's the first time getting under the bar, you know, the initial weeks of their novice progression or something like that, no. I mean, you're right that it's not accurate, right? right. And that's the problem that you're talking about, is the lack of accuracy in a brand new lifter brand new, right? And there's no need to introduce this concept to a brand new lifter, okay. right? Same brand new but as they're getting more trained and they're getting into this early intermediate phase and they have a little bit more experience under their belt and we foresee, or if you are on the same page that this is a useful tool to use in programming long-term, then you can see it as a skill to be able to assess that, right? Because you're transitioning from the phase where everything is, you, you just go in and you get the rep, and if you didn't get the rep, you just, you know, you rack it or you, you, you know, and you're done for the day, and you don't think about anything else, to the point where you actually need to pay attention to that, because you're trying to gauge, you know, manage your fatigue or whatever the case may be. But it's a skill that needs practice, and people vastly overestimate how much practice it requires to get decently good at it and to get decently good at it to the point where it is a useful tool. You don't have to be perfectly accurate, right? We don't even know what perfectly accurate is because say you call something an RPE 8. We didn't make you go to failure two reps later to prove it, right? But if you get reasonably accurate, I just throw out a random thing, plus or minus 
say, right? And you're consistently within that error range over time. Your weights are going up within that range. You're getting stronger. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's a skill that needs to be practiced. And once you're in it within a reasonable range of accuracy, it's fine to use. And you don't need exquisite precision and accuracy every single time. It's OK. Yeah. I have a few nuances. I figured you would. All right. So I agree with everything you said. And I would add that I think that any intelligent adult human can learn to use this just as well as any other system. Okay? And probably within a few after a few weeks mm -hmm. of their novice training, this is a reasonable thing to introduce to them. Just as a concept. Because ideally you have this seamless transition from novice to intermediate, right? And if you have to go through this whole rigmarole of I'm going to teach you RPE. Oh my god, what's RPE? And then they search RPE and a bunch of stuff. RPE stupid, the prob problem is P. Like you, then you have to <laughs> overcome all the stuff. You should have started earlier, but talking about it. So I find some utility in having novices rate their RPE with the caveat that that RPE is meaningless to me as a coach. They're just practicing, right? And I can provide some structured feedback, like they say, that was RP 10. And I'm like, it probably wasn't. It's probably a little lower, right? But I'm not going to tell them what I think it was, because what I think your RPEs are, are sometimes inaccurate all the same, <laughs> right? So he'll send me a video, and, and he's like, I think that was an 8. I'm like, looks like a 0. I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and so I'm just saying, that's why be, my feedback, even as a trained professional, is mm -hmm. not helpful, other than I'm saying that was close or not. You know, as far as RP rating, so I like to. I think introducing it fairly early on is reasonable, as provided I'm not coloring their future RP experience with silly stuff like, oh no, it was definitely RPE this, because that's that's not terribly helpful. I also think that every type of way that you can recommend training parameters to another person uh, with respect to training load has error bars, right? So if I recommend training loads within percentages, right? That has an error bar to it relative to the most recent estimated 1RM and how accurate that is now. Okay? And if I recommend a discrete number, like I want you to squat 330 today, there's an error bar <laughs> based on, on what I'm using that, you know, how I'm driving that number. Like, why am I picking that number? Because it's five pounds more than last time? Well, I think that that's reasonable, okay? But it may not be the case, and that might not be the appropriate training stress for the day. So it is our view that RPE has an acceptable amount of error with a minimal amount of risks. The risks are that you're not perfectly precise in using RPE and don't get the correct amount of stress from the workout, right? But those same risks still exist with percentage-based training and certainly with discrete when you pick a number, right? So if I pick a number that's too high and you miss your reps, now you have no backup plan unless you decide to use RPE on the fly, okay? So there's risk benefits to each one of those things. I think RPE has probably the biggest upside with the smallest amount of downside compared to any of the other methods, provided you give the person enough information. So it's, it's RPE 8, and for this rep range, here's the average percentage, here's what it should feel like, here's what your technique should be like. You're giving all these coaching parameters because you're a coach, and that's what you do. Uh, and I think that it's, it can work pretty well. So that's how, that's why I, I, we like it. As long as you're measuring your bar speed yeah. with like a accurate, uh, uh, m by an accurate means, like a tendo unit or a bar, <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, what is it, squat, si squats and science, their open bar. Open barbell. Yeah. Open barbell. So I had one of those, and I actually made an Excel spreadsheet for each lift. So overhead press, bench press, deadlift, and squat with what RPEs were associated, like what velocity of the barbell was associated with what RPE. And I found those to be pretty consistent. Um, the problem would be that if I would test a warm-up and the velocity would be a certain value, it would be almost like a uh, self-fulfilling prophecy that I'm like, oh, now I'm only good for this, which I didn't like because I'm my own hype man. And I'm, I, 
the, the system's wrong sometimes. So yeah. <laughs> I, ended up selling my, I ended up selling my open barbell. But I think if you're going to use a system like that, it's reasonable. Yeah. There's a lot of times where, you know, your warm-ups start to feel progressively better or vice versa. You start out feeling awesome, and then by the time you get to your work weights, it's not quite what you thought. And so you don't want the initial feelings at 135 to color and nocebo you for the rest of the workout, <laughs> yeah, right? right? So that's, that's just another consideration. Yep. Yeah. Yes to both. Yeah. Um, although I was not facing such steep, steep opposition from the actual surgeon. Uh, but, you know, because basically they were like, do whatever you want to do. You know, you have a new hip. Yeah. Uh, and then, so they squatted and deadlifted. I usually had to start with a box squat just because it reduced range of motion. But they could deadlift, like, from the floor. Completely normal. Yeah, yeah normal. It was fine. Um, I honestly, to be I have not looked into rate of failure with resistance training in that prosthetic replacement. I've done it for knees, and there's no increase in prosthetic joint failment at, uh, uh, failure with uh, replacement of the knee uh, if it's a total knee uh, replacement. So my guess is that a cursory look into the literature would suggest that there's no increased risk of prosth prosthetic failure with uh, no. <laughs> yeah. And this Single brings up plane resistance training in a prosthetic replacement. This brings up a much larger and much more important point that everybody should understand. Would you say it's nuanced? Uh, not even particularly. Oh. <laughs> I'm just saying it's important. All right. Okay, so in general, physicians are risk averse creatures, right? That's what you're experiencing right now. Surgeons, internists, OBGYNs, all are going to be risk averse, right? That's part of why the traditional recommendation long time ago, because we're probably going to get asked about pregnancy at some point here, we'll go ahead and address it, was they used to say, oh, just bed rest when you're pregnant. Don't move, right? Because you wouldn't want anything to happen. And then they started loosening the exercise recommendations. Oh, you can move around. And then you can walk. And then you can exercise aerobically at a pace where you can maintain a conversation. And now they're saying you can resistance train yeah, you want, yeah. with like three kilogram dumbbells. You see, the, you, you see where this is going, right? But very risk averse. Combine that risk aversion with a complete lack of understanding of the benefits of resistance training. And you see how this recommendation ends up being just really not, I, I don't, I don't want to bash this surgeon in particular, but it's an ill-informed recommendation. Because, as we're saying, they're based on our, based on the evidence related to knees. We haven't necessarily looked at hips yet, but the rate of catastrophic failure of this prosthesis is exceedingly low, if existent at all, compared to the case we've made for resistance training in the aging individual today. Right. Yeah. So, if this surgeon is there, is is by telling this person, "I don't want you to do those things, so just walk more." Yeah. Or don't even walk. I don't know what they're telling this person yeah, to do, right? Just but avoid chill. anything that puts force on the hip that I put in you. Well, what the hell is that hip for? Yeah. Right? So it's just a it's just risk aversion combined with a lack of understanding of the benefits. If, you know, in any other context in medicine, when we're making recommendations where we have a clearer understanding of the risks and benefits of something, we feel way more comfortable and confident giving a particular recommendation. The problem is in those situations where there's a hypothetical risk and a complete unawareness of the benefits, yet the recommendation is still given just as confidently. Does that make sense? Whereas I would think that that recommendation should be tempered quite a bit, obviously, yeah, he should to say said, that this person know. can benefit a whole lot from strength training, right? And I don't know what the risks are of failure of this prosthesis, but if you're willing to accept whatever that risk might be for the benefits that you might get from a life from strength training for the rest of your life, which may include this, 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 then go for it. That's, in my opinion, how could it not benefit him It can't not benefit him. Right, or right. No, there's, there's a huge benefit. We know there's the benefit. We the just, surgeon doesn't know there's a benefit. Right, <laughs> right. We just don't know if there is a huge gaping risk. Right. Although... Although, Ed Cone, bilateral, hip Squatted joint replacement. 660 with two hips. Yeah. Right? Both hips done, 660, set of five. 
Right. So I'm not saying that that proves that there is no risk, but it certainly suggests that the catastrophic risk is, is probably likely not the case. Yeah. More likely that there is some increased risk of prosthesis failure than if you were to sit on your ass all day. Although, you know, you have an increased risk of getting hit by a car if you leave your house. So we yeah. just don't know what the risk is. Do the lights on those things on hip replacements? Yes, and it depends on the materials. and depends on a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. how it's placed and the person it's placed in. But you know, it, it's the way that I view the, you know, lifespan on the thing. It's like if you're going to live long enough to outlast your the lifespan of the deal anyway, like you know the second procedure is coming – I wouldn't try to milk it. The idea of getting the hip is so you can g do better so you can things. Live, right? <laughs> it's like my dad got his knee done, right? He, like twenty years, just <sighs> my knee. Like every, they couldn't do anything, right? Like everything he loved, riding motorcycles, or working on a car, or motor something in the garage, lifting. Like you know, he didn't lift before, but I wanted to teach him to squat for a long time. But then he has no, he had no menisci in either knee, and they were like. He was like, I just, I don't know if I can do it. Anyway, I came home from medical school one time, and he was squatting. I was like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? But anyway, so he gets his knee replaced, and he's like, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Why did I wait so long? Why didn't you tell me? And I was like, <laughs> I mean, I don't know, man. You don't listen to me. So, yeah. Yep. Live the better life. So to answer your question, I probably would not. And here's why. Because by the time that they got down to their this ideal weight, body composition, whatever, they're probably not a novice anyway. And at that time, I've introduced them to more advanced training uh, to o overall improve their work capacity, their ability to tolerate training anyway. So the novice progression no longer represents a significant amount of stress to them. So they went through the novice LP, and, and by, the, by that time, you probably run out their novice games just by the internet. Correct. A after they, uh, uh, we could uh, probably, probably would have already got them onto intermediate programming because, how do you I mean you don't know how long it's going to take them to get down to that acceptable body weight and risk factor level? Yeah. And if they've been doing a bunch of intermediate programming by the time they get there, what's the point of regressing them in terms of all training variables back? There's an again? exception. So what if this person says, you know what, you're a really cool guy, I like what you do. I want to go do a meet just like you. I want to be just like you. So they go do a powerlifting meet. You peaked them, right? So they go and do a meet. Effectively, peaking is akin to detraining, right? Volume, exposure, fatigue, everything goes down. And the idea is that once you reduce all that fatigue and volume and stimuli, that you have a higher performance than you would if you didn't. So effectively, they detrained. And then you put them back on the novice LP. That could happen. I actually did that to a guy, a few folks, and they actually went above their current training levels on the LP. So is that non-specific to people who lose weight? So somebody that Correct. For a meet, it's a reasonable thing you could try uh -huh. after a meet, particularly for somebody who's like in the early to middle intermediate stages, put them back on an LP. And then you also think about all the other benefits they have at the time. They know how to train. They know the variables. You know, their form's better, all this other sort of stuff. They might be able to milk that out for a few weeks and see some improvements. <laughs> And it gets you off the hook from programming for a few weeks. So, <laughs> you know, that's a win. Uh, it could in a couple situations. So the idea would be that if you had, let's say you ate five times per day and three grams of leucine per meal, five meals, and that's about 20 to 25 grams of protein. Let's give it 25. So we'll say it's 125 grams of dietary protein that you're taking in per day from a leucine-rich source, okay? The issue is that the additional calor calorie sources that you're getting the rest of your food from have protein in there, in them, right? So depending on your calorie level, you need to allot for trace proteins from carbohydrates and fats, right? And you also need to allow for not leucine-rich sources of protein unless you're sticking to whey or, or chicken or, you know, steak for all of your, for all of your meals. Uh, the, other, the other thing uh, that would come into question is the more calorie restricted you are, I would actually advocate for a little bit more leucine per meal, probably, from, from animal protein, which is the same thing as that co more complicated formula 
I gave you than the one gram per pound, right? So I wanted to wow you, show you that I'm up to date. Uh, but the formula came from Eric Helms, and he basically was studying, you know, high level bodybuilders and, and uh, strength athletes who were, who, uh, and what their dietary practices were, what the results were. And so it was 2.3 to 3.1 grams of protein per kilo body weight. And the things that shifted folks towards that higher level were how lean they were, what their calorie restriction level was, right, and how uh, active they were. So the leaner they were, the more calorie restricted they were, and the more activity, the higher the protein intake. Um, so anyway, to answer your question, could you get away with uh, 150 grams of protein a day? You could, provided you weren't losing any, trying to lose any weight and you weren't very active. Um, but I think that your, when you account for your total calorie intake, your total protein intake is going to be over 200. Because you know, if you have rice, for instance, that's got protein in it, right? Oatmeal, same sort of deal. So I don't know how you could get all of your carbohydrates and fats without getting close to 200 grams of protein a day, which I think would be, or how much do you weigh? Did you say 180? Uh, 200. 200, yeah. So I don't, I don't know how you could get you know, significantly far away from 200 grams of protein a day once you calculate it in the rest of your non-protein only food sources. Does that make sense? So you're saying we're strong? Yeah, well, it's been a long time. <laughs> Someone call me strong, you know, they say, you're pretty strong for your size. And I say, well, how big do I have to get to just be strong? Or how strong do I have to get to just be strong? Like, what is it? So uh, I was a competitive athlete of all kinds growing up, soccer, baseball, ended up swimming for the longest period of time. I swam for like 15 years. And uh, after and I then, finished swimming, I wanted to... I uh, actually tried to continue swimming on my own, but got super bored not swimming with a team, competitive team around me. And so uh, I, was, I was going into the gym and just doing the stuff that my college strength and conditioning coach was having us do. And I was like, I don't really know what I'm doing. And I wanted to not get fat because I didn't want to keep eating like a swimmer, but not training like a swimmer anymore, as a lot of people do. So I ended up finding a lot of the stuff that we now recommend people read, read the books and a lot of the materials. And back in 2010 or 2011 or whatever, around that time, started my own novice linear progression. Started squatting in the mid, low to mid 100s, I think, for a set of five, something like 150 for sets of five when I started my novice progression. So that was really my motivation for starting to find it. And uh, having been a lifelong athlete, I just had the kind of the, the training history, the mindset of like, you know, I train to pursue certain goals and compete and stuff like that. Um, Went through my progression, did a bunch of other stuff. By the time I got to med school and second year of medical school, I met this guy and we ended up, he ended up convincing me to go to a seminar and kind of took it from there. How do we meet? Now here we are. We met because he was hitting on my now wife. <laughs> it's not my fault. You, so. She was single back then, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my background, yeah. Uh, I, let's see, so I started training, um, well, not training. I started bench pressing in high school because, you know, that's what you had to do. But I didn't start training till after so my freshman year of college. I came home, did my first dirt bike race in a year because I'd been away at college, came back. I used to race dirt bikes. That was my, my thing. Um, so anyway, went to a motor, uh, race, uh, ended up dislocating my hip and was out of commission for like three months. Like barely could walk, limping around, you know, awful. And so anyway, it was suggested that I should start like, I should do rehab, but don't lift weights, which in my mind meant you should lift weights. <laughs> so anyway, I started doing weird stuff in the gym that, I mean, you just look on the internet like exercise for, uh, you know, hip dislocation. Uh, and anyway, so I ended up hook, uh, hooking up with these guys at the gym who were power lifters. It was so cool. I thought it was awesome because they were a bunch of chalk chalk seems like a good idea <laughs> and like they were really sweaty sweat seems like a good idea well, I was into it it was, it was cool <laughs> um, so anyway I never actually did an obvious linear progression I just trained the lifts once per week uh, my first year of training I ended up squatting 500 I pulled 545 and I benched 365 that's like my first year of training I went from 170 pounds to 230 pounds that was my like year long like just add weight to the bar every week uh, and then I spent six years screwing around 
before I hit another PR. So it's funny that the more that I learned, the worse that I got until I had learned enough to realize that I had been screwing up. <laughs> um, so I actually never competed until, yeah, about my seventh year of tra like exercising. Or, uh, and uh, I weighed in 176 pounds as a little small mutant. And uh, then I met Rip. And he told me I needed to gain 100 pounds of body weight. <laughs> so we settled for 30, and, and, here, and here we are. Yeah.